So obviously we have seen already uh, the bond route that happened um, sort of in November, I guess was at its most intense, October, November. What do you see when you look at historical perspective that indicate that we could see the makings of a, a really more severe bond route? Uh, well, Julie, the last 35 years really constitute one of the most remarkable periods, periods in economic history for the global risk-free asset. Uh, and you really have to go back to the 15th and 16th century to find similar bond market rallies in terms of yield compression, in terms of sheer length uh, of the bond market rally than what we've seen since 1981, since Paul Volcker declared war on inflation uh, after the oil shocks. Uh, and when nominal yields hit uh, less than 140 basis points in July of last year, that represented the lowest nominal yield uh, that the risk-free asset in the world has ever hit uh, since 1285. Now you can imagine th uh, that the flip side of that story is that the potential reversal of that uh, bull market can equally assume historic proportions once it really gets on the way. Mm. Now and my research really, yeah. Uh, Here's the thing, Paul, for years, market watchers have been warning about the bond market ending its bull run. They've always been proven wrong at the end of the day. What's different this time? Well, I think we are seeing the first signs of really an inflation reversal and, in, and a steep pickup in prints all over the world. I mean, just today we had the print from China where PPI now hit 5.5%. I mean, up until last September, China was actually exporting deflation to the world. Now it's uh, steeply picking up uh, exporting inflation throughout the world. We had a very uh, high print from Germany just last week where inflation increased by almost 100 basis points between November and December. Uh, and uh, just look at the latest U.S. jobs report where hourly earnings are now growing by 2.9%. Uh, and when you look at several precedents it, just in the 20th century when investors faced the steepest losses uh, for bond holdings, then the inflation reversal type is really one of the ugliest uh, on record. And I compare the current uh, backdrop uh, for the risk-free asset really to the second half of the 1960s uh, when bond investors were faced with a similar combination of you know, fiscal uh, uh, expansion by Lyndon Johnson against the backdrop of the Vietnam War. Uh, we had a very tight U.S. labor market. Uh, and in the end, within four years, uh, bond investors lost an aggregated 36% uh, in real terms uh, in that period. And I think, you know, we are facing rather that sort of scenario than the sort of steep uh, sell-off that we saw in 1994, when actually bond markets returned to, uh, to uh, bu a bullish sentiment just a year later. Mm. Uh, to what extent, though, Paul, uh, as we see rising inflation, will that then provide something of a cap to growth and also uh, sort of in a cycle here to inflation itself? In other words, if you're going to start to see a heating up of inflation, a heating up of wage growth, won't that then suppress GDP to some extent and also infla you know, inflation down the road to some extent? No, I think uh, GDP is, is still printing at reasonable levels. I mean, the, the optimism in places like Germany, which provides the, the equivalent risk-free rate for Europe, is pretty strong. Uh, PMIs in, in the UK, for instance, are holding up pretty well. Um, and I think, you know, if, if the fiscal stimulus really materializes in the US as well, then uh, to some extent equity investors uh, still have reason to cheer. And I don't think it will necessarily choke up growth in, if it's combined with with the kind of fiscal action in some jurisdictions. Paul, what can central banks, policymakers do today to limit the fallout from the emerging market bond market reversal? Well, I think, unfortunately, we have to live with the fact that we cannot undo QE at this stage. I think the best idea would have been not to engage in this kind of unprecedented price distortion that we uh, we started after the 08 financial crisis. Now we have to li live with the fact that really investors have been conditioned for years to really misprice the real uh, risk compensation for, for fixed income assets. When you look at places like, like Italy, the, the other European peripheral states, uh, it really becomes clear that the normalization process, uh, one way or the other, will be wobbly, I think. Uh, but at this stage, when I look at countries like uh, Japan, when I look at the Eurozone, I think you can contain the fallout by at least withdrawing earlier rather than later from the purchases that are still going on. 
I think the, the ECB, for instance, should overthink its decision really to extend QE mm. until the end of 2017 in light of, you know, the fastest rising German inflation since 1993. That's a 23-year high now. Um, uh, you can apply all sorts of nice academic tailor rules that, that all will show you that, uh, you know, discount rates should be materially higher than they are now. For the Eurozone, the, the rate is, for instance, 1.3% uh, now. And I think if you start conditioning the market earlier, really, for, for a return to market pricing of risk, then at least we can, we can contain the fallout to some extent. And very quickly, do you see evidence of Draghi doing just that then, conditioning the markets that way? Well, I don't really think that the decision in December constituted a tapering per se. I mean, uh, of course, we have a really packed electoral calendar in Europe in 2017. I think the decision has to be understood against that backdrop. I mean, you don't really want a fallout by, uh, in, in the sovereign bond space by withdrawing too early and then getting an increase in political risk. So to that extent, it's understandable. But really, for investors, it's, it's rather bad news. Uh, and I think also the decision to to really steepen the yield curve uh, might be good for banks in the end. We have seen banks right. in the Eurozone uh, rally, for instance. But for, for a lot of other people, you know, life insurance, for instance, it's, it's rather bad news. And I think uh, to that extent, it's the Draghi hasn't conditioned the market uh, enough at this stage.